Okay, let's start. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, my name is Björn Sandvik and uh, I'm a core developer here in Oslo on the GIS app. Uh, we are going to look at, uh, at the maps app and also we're going to move beyond the map, only not creating the map that you can look at, but also see how you can use GIS tools to, to do spatial analysis. And to do that, we currently need to move out of DHIS2 and into a GIS application. So just briefly about myself, as I said, I've been here since in five years. So I started on the old GIS app, which I think quite a few of you have used as well. And this one is now replaced by the current uh, Maps app. Um, which is now the core GIS app. I have a master degree in geographical information science at the University of Edinburgh. Often you will see the term GIS in these presentations and elsewhere when we talk about map and often at university level, GIS means geographical information science. While we're more talking about the, the programs and software, it's geographical information systems. And that is what we will focus on today. Uh, previously, I worked for various clients. I worked for the, for the UN, uh, the, the national broadcaster here in Norway. I love mountains and trekking, and I've done quite a bit of work for the Norwegian Trekking Association and also the Norwegian Polar Institute. But everything has to be done, uh, has been circling around making mapping platforms for these organizations. So there is uh, a community of uh, DHS2 community page where you can post questions during this session. You'll find the link on the agenda. Uh, I will try to have a look if we have time at the end and try to answer the questions uh, at the end of this session. I think we will have a time for it. Bjorn, I'll also uh, keep an eye on that. So I'll let you know if there are any uh, important questions that come up. Great, thanks. Uh, what will be covered? So we will have two, uh, two sections. The first, we will have a closer look at the map set and we will go a bit more in detail than what Lars could do on his session on Monday. And especially I've written new-ish because not all these features are from the last version. Actually, one or two of them go back to 231, but they are maybe less used and but still quite powerful. So we will especially look at uh, new features for event layers. And we will also have a look at thematic layers and then especially how you can map change, which has been difficult until we launch the split view and timeline, uh, timeline maps. And then we will also see how you can include population data in DHIS2 maps, but at the same time see what's, what the limitations are and that will lead us over to the next session where we will do analysis with the same population data in a desktop program called QGIS. And what we will do there is that we will export data from DHIS2 and then combine it with the population data from a different source and then measure the population within, for example, your org unit boundaries or around your health facilities, which is a highly requested feature uh, to be able to do. So I will start with the maps app. Uh, I plan to uh, use the release candidate for 235 to demo, so wish me good luck. Uh, this is just a short overview of when we added the different features that I will demo. So you see through from 231 and then to 235. So you can look where your own version is and sort of what you can do from use from this session yourself. For the second session with the QGIS, we will only use the layer data download. I, th I think most of you are, should be on uh, 231. So you should be able to, to use that feature. So I will start with the event layers. So I'll move over to the maps app. So uh, I will start by creating an event. 
layer. So I go here, I will select the malaria case registration. And then for period, we also made a change for this version because previously, uh, previously we didn't use the setting that is available in the general settings. There you have a default relative period for analysis. And this one is last 12 months. Uh, before this was not used by the maps app, but now it's present. So basically the only thing you need now to create a map is just to select an indicator and then go with the defaults. And, and you should have a map already. So I will just now make a change and say last six months and then update the layer. So this is the view that you are probably used to. When you add a lot of events, they will be clustered like this. So if I zoom out, uh, we will see that there are 50, more than 50,000 events on this map. And then as you zoom in, they will uh, go into more detailed clusters. And this one is fairly fast to use because this is clustered on the server. So the only thing we actually download is the, these circles with the numbers inside. We don't download all the individual events. Um, so this is very good for on low bandwidth um, instances. But what you're now able to do is that you can actually show all the 50,000 events at the same time. So if I'm going to switch to view all events, I'm also going to look to style this by gender. So we will not only have black dots, but we will have one color for male and one for female. So this feature was added in 231. And then update the layer. It will take a little time to load. But now here we actually have 50,000 events showing at the same time. And this is only possible after 234 version because what we did then was to change the whole mapping platform or the mapping engine of the, to use uh, a web technology called WebGL, which are capable of doing this. Uh, so that's a very good reason to upgrade if you have problems of showing a lot of data at the same time. And you will also see that this is very smooth. You can zoom in and out very fast and it's no problem for the browser. And also in this version before you had like fixed zoom level, so it will go in, but now it's a continuous zoom. So you can very easily adapt the view to directly uh, the bounds of your data. So what happens then if we have this view and we still feel that this is a bit messed, we don't want to see every, all the 50,000 at the same time, we can go back and group them. So we go back and have a cluster. And previously, this will show back to the, as the black circles. But now we have added something called the uh, donut charts. This looks like donuts with a hole in the middle. And so there in the middle, you see the number and then you will see the distribution within. So for, for the gender is quite each equally, equally set. We can have a look at this number six. So here it's one male and then five females within this group. And if we zoom in, we will see that this is dividing further. So into three groups, and then we, in this one, we have one male, one female, and then you zoom in and you see the individual. So the good thing with this is that you can sort of see the pattern of your data also with the clusters that was not previous, um, possible previously. And so basically any data element that is connected to the program can be used. So for here also, you can, we can select age and years, and then we, you can also have the same legend uh, possibility as you do with a thematic layer. Uh, so I'll choose an automatic equal intervals, can change the color scale, and then update the layer. And then especially if you have like a population where there may be elderly people on the country, <laughs> rural areas, this would easily show in, uh, on this map. And okay, 
I will may show you one more feature of the event layers that is actually added in 35, hopefully coming in a week or two. Um, if I select this in patient morbidity and mortality program, and then I can still take style by gender. Here you see if you have more data elements to use for, for styling. And then add layer. No, I don't want to have the cluster, so I select view all events, last 12 months. Uh, one thing just to show here is that we also have flaws in our data or errors. So the reason why it zooms like this is that we have one a male who unfortunately, unfortunately died at the age of 50 on the something called the Null Island. So uh, often with, if you don't have a coordinate or if you, have, if you add zero, zero to your location, it's, it's, it's still a valid coordinate, coordinate. So it happens, it ends up on something that is named the Null Island. So it's actually nothing there. It's, uh, it's the place on the earth that don't exist that actually has the most health facilities. And very often if you can't find an event or a uh, facility, often go and look at Null Island and there is plenty there. So we'll try to fix this one. Uh, but now I will zoom into this and then show you the new feature. And that is the data table, which has been available for other layers like the thematic and boundary layer, but not for events. And I think this is quite powerful because this allows you to filter your data to sort of dig in and see the patterns directly in the browser. Because now we have downloaded all the events and we, all the filtering is done here directly and the map is instantly updated. Uh, you will also see that we have added some extra data elements here, and these you can define in the, in this one, when you uh, set, when you do the maintenance of the program. So when you select the data elements to the program, you have an option to select display in reports. So those who are checked here, they will also show in the event data table, as well as in when you click on the individual events, it will also show in the pop-up. So what you can do now is that we can, for example, filter on all females. And then you see instantly the map is updating. Maybe we only want to look below year 30, which will further mode of discharge died. And maybe with a certain diagnosis. And 390. So you can see very quickly, we can sort of explore and get down the data set. And now we are down to for individual cases. So this can be a very fast and quick way to, to explore your, your event data. When, if you save this map, this view won't be saved because this is all in the browser. But if you want to have this filter activated on the dashboard, for example, you can do the same in the filter tab for the event here. So here we can add the same with the gender and, and age and when you do it like this, this will be done on the server and you can save it with the map. Okay, so that's all I plan to save with the event layer. So I'll move on to the thematic layers. So, so far we have only supported one thematic type and we haven't named it before because we only had one type and that is called the choroplat. So now I will create a map from a data element with the way that you are used to see it. So I select malaria. And then malaria referrals I will use. And then we can go with the defaults. Again, this last 12 months will show be selected by default here. So it should be very quick to create a map. And the problem with this one is that these are raw numbers. These are not per capita. And this is not a recommended way of showing this data because it's quite easy to interpret. The user who sees this map could easily think that this is 
district is doing very good or very bad, depending on the data, compared to the neighboring ones. But that is because also because the, the data is not normalized. So if there's not much more people living here than the neighboring district, maybe this one is actually doing better per capita. So for that reason, we have now added support for it's we call it the bubble map of very often you will see proportional symbol map for this type. The bubble map is getting a bit more popular word and we might also support bubble charts uh, later on. So we would like to use the same, same term. So if we switch to this one and then just update, instead of colorizing the whole districts, we are calculating the center or a center point within the polygon. We still show the boundaries so you can get an idea of, of the area the circle is covering. But then we are making these circles that are scaled according to the data value. So actually here, uh, they are scaled, they're scaled and colorized according to the data value. And this is the recommended technique. If you have, for example, the number of COVID-19 cases, this is the raw numbers. This is the map you should use and not the other one, the Coroplex. So we have also some options here. You can select the radius uh, up to 50. Uh, since we have two, we, these are called visual variables. Maybe you don't want to use both color and size to show the same variable so we can switch to just a single color and maybe turn on the labels we can make them a bit bigger and then update the layer so here you have one color with labels and the legend here on the left side uh, so if we look at kenema kenema <laughs> here uh, we can see that for the last 12 months, they had 1292 malaria referrals. If you are interested in knowing how this has changed over the last 12 months, this has been a bit difficult uh, until we launched uh, the time maps, which I will now show. So what you can do is to go and edit, and then under period, if you have selected a relative period, you have two more options. So this is still the default one is to aggregate the data over the 12 last months and then show that as a single map. But you can also select timeline uh, and we click update and what then happens I think I will go back to also have the colors so we have some more idea on how it's changing so we go back to this one update. So what you now have is that a month by month view for the last 12 months. So then you can see it like in, for this district, this was 100 in September last year. And then it's also possible to click this play button and you will go through the last uh, 12 months and you can see how the situation is changing. You can also Instead of this, just click on the single months to go directly to this. So this is one of the options we added, but still it can be a bit hard because you, your mind needs to remember how it was the previous month. So you, it's a good way to sort of maybe get an ind indication if it's going up and down, especially if you're following one, one district, but uh, it's still a bit hard to follow. So for that reason, we also added another option and that is to have the split view maps. So instead of a timeline, we will actually add one map per month. You can see that this is getting a little bit cramped uh, because the maps are of course much more smaller when we show 12 at the same time. So I will change the styling a bit. I will turn off the labels and then having the max radius to 25 and then update the layer and then it should be easier to see. And also a good feature we added, I think in the 234 version was to have the full screen view. So this is especially useful on the dashboard, but also in the maps app, if you click on this, the map will cover the whole screen. So you can have all the space available. 
And this split view maps operates that whenever you are zooming in or interacting with one of the maps, it will do the same with all the other maps. So you'll always have the side by side view of the same, same bounds of the map. So here, I think it's much easier to sort of see the outliers or how that uh, there were very few referrals in one month compared to another and so on to have this side by side view. Okay, so that's the new bubble map, timeline map and split view map in the, for the thematic layer. So then we, I will move on to the population layer, which we will look at for the rest of the section actually. Uh, so by going new. For those of you who have Google Earth engine enabled, for instance, you will see these six layers. So this is what we have added so far with data. So Google Earth engine is just that Google offers uh, server space in the, in the cloud <laughs> And, and, and as well, uh, computing power, which allows different organizations. So for example, the population density layer is from WorldPop, and then they can host it there, and then it's made accessible for users like us. So it's a free resource, but every, for every instance, you need a separate agreement with Google and a spe special like a token to, to be able to use these layers. So now if I add the population density, so I select the year there for this layer here, there are different countries from for different layers. So for now I'll just use the, the latest one. Can you also check, change the styling here, the colors. So it sort of matches the population with, if you are a country with, with a very small population, you can adjust these numbers. So, so it, it applies to, to your population distribution and then add the layer. So here you see, you just, you just have data for a few countries, but you should find for most of them if you select a different year. And we will also try to improve this to get more data available for, for different years actually, so you can see the change. So if I zoom in, what you will see that this is made up of small, small squares. So this, squares here is 100 by 100 meters. So this is the resolution for the data set, quite high, quite high resolution for this one. And what you also can do is that you can right click anywhere on the map and then select population density and you will get the population density per square kilometer at that particular area. So you can see here is 310, we click here it's more, almost 3,000, 3,800. Uh, but then it sort of stops. This is what you can do with a population layer in, in DHIS2 maps. You could of course add the facilities on top here and see where it's a dense population, where it's not, but you can't get the actual numbers. And that is what we will do now for the next part of the session. Switch back to this one. So there is one important distinction. Uh, if you worked a little bit with GIS tools, you will already know this. Uh, we haven't bothered to make this distinction in the maps app because we mostly work with only one of the data types with vector data. And we also try our best to make the maps app very simple to use. So you don't need to to now have all this background knowledge. But now when we are moving out from DHS2 maps into another program, this distinction is quite important. So we have two types of data when we talk about mapping or GIS. And one is vector data. And these are represented by simple geometry types. So for example, or it's most often it's just points which just have a latitude, longitude location. So that will be, for example, your facilities. Uh, and then we can have lines. These are often used to map roads and rivers. And we also use them to map tract entity relationships. Then we draw a line between two points. 
to attract entities. And then we have polygons, which is like an area uh, which we use to represent your org unit hierarchy above the facility level, where you have the districts, uh, for example. And the good thing about this is that uh, the, all of these have unique IDs, and then it can easily be linked to the other data tables that we have in DHS2. So we can link it to the indicators you have, data elements, and then we use this to create the maps. So we can store vector data now for organization units, events, and tracked entities so far in DHS2. Uh, raster data, on the other hand, it's uh, instead of represented by these geometry types, this is a grid of cells or pixels. So the one, the population data we just looked at uh, was represented as a raster data. And that had a resolution of 100 by 100 meters. And then for each and every cell within this raster data, there will be one or sometimes more than one value. So uh, uh, this could be the population, elevation data, or whatever. So we don't support storing of raster data in DHS2 so far, but you can import the data. Um, so uh, there are two ways you can import raster data so far. You could even go through the Google Earth engine. They, they, will, all, they will all be raster data. Or you can use the external layer where you can add, for example, data from ArcGIS, which is also raster data. So then we are moving over to QGIS. Uh, QGIS is uh, free to use desktop application. It's an open source program. Uh, you can do, this is just an example, and I'm selected QGIS not only because it's a great application, uh, but it's um, and freely available, of course. So, so that is the reason. It's, and it's also open source, like DHS2. There are other GIS programs. I think quite a few of you might know ArcGIS. So the things I'm showing you here, you can also easily do in ArcGIS. These are quite basic GIS operations. But the examples here will be in QGIS, which should be accessible for, for everyone of the audience. So uh, you can download QGIS from this website. I would recommend just to try to follow along. I think this session, or I know this session is recorded, so you can go back and, and see what I'm doing. And then I've also added uh, quite detailed slides. I will do this live in QGIS, but you should be able to follow these slides also where I've marked different tools and, and how you should do it. So first we need some population data. So now instead of going to Google Earth Engine, we will go directly to the source. And WorldPop is a great, great site with lots of data up to date and, um, and covering a, a vast majority of, of the Earth. So you can read about how these data sets are created. I don't, want, I, I don't have time to go into the details but we will use the population data, which is available here. So there are population counts, which we will access. And then there are different methods of how you can, can calculate or make these data sets of the population. So I'm not going into details about this, but I'm using the constrained individual countries, UN adjusted. So it means that the total population is adjusted to the official figures. So they should match this data set. So if I click on this one, you have all for all the countries. So the quickest is just to, to search for the country. So I'm taking Sierra Leone as we already have the demo data for this one. And then download and then download at the end here. So when you have the, the data, we can um, go to QGIS. So when you open QGIS, it looks like this. It might be a bit more over overwhelming than the Maps app because you have a lot of more possibilities and tools. 
but it's also a little bit similar that you have the mapping area here and then you have the laid layer panel to the left. So we are also trying to make it this like a standard in for GIS tools. So I will show you the two ways of import your data. One is to go to layer and then add layer. And here you need to know the distinction between vector and raster. And the population data is a raster layer. So we go on add raster. And then we can select the layer and then open, add and close. And then we have the population layer here. I'm also going to show you a quick way, which I normally use, uh, remove layer. And that is just to have your folder with your data set and just drag it over. So when you use this, it just looks at the extension of the file to, to figure out what sort of file it is. So then you don't need to remember if the vector or raster, it will most of the time just work if you just drag the file to the, to the program. So this one is uh, just shown in black and white. Uh, so we would like to style this layer. So two ways you can do it, either right click and properties or just double click the layer and you get this similar to the layer dialogue that we have in the maps app, but here many, many more possibilities. So the first thing we could do is to change the layer name. So we could just call it population. And then we would like to style this layer. And the tool I often use is the histogram. What that will do is that it will show you a graph of the distribution of your layer. So here we can see that most of the values are between zero and 50. So we can use this when we want to style the layer. We can see here that the highest value is 323, but there are very, very few. So we don't need to have it like a separate class about 300, for example. It will only be probably only be one, one of these tiny squares, which is part of that group. So we can go to some symbology and we will now go from gray to color. And here we can set the min and max. So we will go new, set zero to, to the start value and then 50 at the maximum value for the classification. And then we can have this color scale here. You can select another one and we will have, make a nice scale. So we'll try to make for every 10. So I take equal intervals and then six classes. So you should then have for every 10. Uh, there are lots of options. Very often it's just nice to have this open. And then if you click apply, you can see the changes on the map. So you can still make adjustments. But then when you're done, you click OK. And then we can zoom in to the layer. And here, to, here you will also see the individual 100 by 100 meters square. And if we want to check the um, the individual values here, you have this tool here, identifier tool. So click on that one, and then you can click on a square, and then it will show you the value. So within these 100 by 100 meters, it's estimated uh, 40 people living. On this one, 18 people are living. So what, the first thing we would like to do now is to finding the total population for Sierra Leone. So that we can do by sum the values of every cell, grid cell in this data set. So for this, we need to use a tool, some processing tools that are available. These are okay, available up here. You can see it's a toolbox under processing. A quick way to reach it is to click on this button here. And here there are a couple of hundreds tools that you can do analysis on your data. So it's very, a lot you can do, very powerful. We will just demo a few of them. 
So I find a nice way to find them is just to search for them. So I, I now want to have <coughs> statistics of this layer. So there is one tool called raster layer statistics. So if I double click that one, and then it has already selected the layer for me because it's the only layer I've added. And there, there can be multiple values for each of these raster data set, and then they will be called different, and they will have different band. They will be called bands. But for the one we are using here, it's only one value, which is the population count. So then I click run, and then they, this one will calculate the total population for this data set, which is 7.97 million, almost 8 million. This is, was from 2020. And if I did a search here on the population of Sierra Leone, I see that that was matching, matching the value. So this could also be just to make a check of, of, the, of the data set. Uh, what we should also do now is to save the project. So we have a backup at least. So I just type C uh, population. Okay. So what we are now going to do is that we are going to measure the population within our own org units. So the first thing we will do is to go back to the Maps app, create some boundaries, and then download them to use. So I'll add a new boundary layer, select level. I will select district, and then add layer. So now we have the districts here. And then this is the important thing you need to use to download the data from this context menu. And this will download the data together with some metadata with a name and so on, ID, uh, in a format called GeoJSON, which is supported by, I would say, all, <laughs> almost all GIS programs out there. And again, the easy way is to just drag the file over and you will have your district. What you see here that these are not really only boundaries or lines, these are polygons, so they also have a, a fill by default. And now it's covering the population. Of course, we can just drag and drop this as you can in a map app to have the population on top, but I think we would like only to show the boundaries. So for that, you double click and you click on the fill for the color and then you can change the fill style to be no brush and then okay and then we will only have the boundaries so what we now can do is to calculate the population within each of these boundaries so we will then go back to the processing toolbox move this to the bottom so click on this one, and then it's another statistics tool. We're not doing it for the whole raster layer, but just for the, the different polygons. And that one is called Sonal Statistics. Double click that one, and then the raster layer is still the same. Only one value, band one. And then the vector layer we want to use as the zones are the boundaries layer. This will add some properties or columns to our data. So I will just prefix this with population. And you can also see here, I'll go with the default, but you can also see the sort of calculation you can do from, the, from this menu here. And then we go to run. And then it has, by counting every square that falls within each of these districts, uh, it has measured the population. And this can of course be any sort of polygon. It doesn't need to be 
the district where you maybe have the population already, it can be any sort of area you can define. And then if I use the identifier tool and click on this, you will see the population count. So in this district is 21,000. This one, no, so, sorry. Uh, this is the population count. It's just the number of these cells, 100 by 100 meters. Population sum is the total population. So in this, it's 850,000 people living in this district. Uh, we can also open the attribute table, which is called data table in the maps app and then we will have a list this is a long table so we'll just uh, make it shorter by right clicking here organize columns deselect all and then i select only name and population sum and then you have a list here of every every district and if you click on this you can sort them um, uh, from the highest population, 1.7 million, to the lowest, which is only yeah, 200,000 people living within. So this was how, what you can do with your uh, org unit polygons. Uh, if we would like to see people living around facilities like, like a hospital, we need to use a different technique. So I'll go back to the maps app. I will add some facilities. So go to facility layer. And for this, just to not get too many, I will only uh, have of group hospital. Add layer. And then we have this same procedure so you click on this menu download the data download and then what you can do is to go back to qgis open your data folder and miss this one okay i'll do it the other way uh, layer, add layer, vector layer, and then select the facilities layer and open. And then add and close. And now this will sh just show us tiny small dots on the map. So we would like to style this one as well. So I double click the layer. I can change the name to hospitals and then to style it I would like to use a special symbol for hospital so I search for it here and I find a hospital icon and then I add this to the map and you have these small red crosses. I will also just rename the boundaries layer to districts. So now we have the facilities. There is one extra complexity here, and that is that these, fa the, these facilities are in latitude, longitude degrees. And what, uh, what I would like to do is that I will find the population living within five kilometers from this. And that is a, a bit hard for most of us to express in, in latitude and longitude degrees. So I need to change the map projection of this to be able to do that. So I will do that by exporting the layer, layer save the same features. I haven't, and then I can just name it hospitals projected. And then here I can select a map projection. This is a very complex field within mapping. So will not go into detail, but basically you should know what your national projection is for your country and use that one. You could also search for a country and see projections that are meant for that country. So I will use this one. And then, okay. So this should now 
have been done and already added again to the map. So now we have two hospital layers. And then we will use this last one to calculate the zone around each hospital. So we'll basically make a buffer that you can also do in the, in the maps app. So again, we go back to the toolbox. We search for buffer. And then you can see if I switch between the, if I take the hospitals, you get a warning and this is also in degrees. So it's, you can't give a distance here in meters. So, but in the one we converted, we have the possibility to add a distance in meters. So we, I would like to have five kilometers from a buffer around each hospital. So I write 5,000 and then run. And then we will have these added. And these two are sort of covering the, the hospital and data. We could move it below the, at least the hospitals. And then if we double click them, we can change the style so I will select a yellow color and then make it transparent like this. And then we select okay. And then you get this view and you can see what's contained inside. So what we now want to do is that to count every population square within each of these circles. And then we can use the same tools as we did with the polygons because now these are just turned into circular polygons on our map. So we search on statistics, zone of statistics, and then raster layer will still be the same population layer. And then we select the buffers for the population. And then we also add the same column prefix and then run. And if we now click on this, this, and to see, you will see you have the population count. So around this hospital here, there is the population of 52,000. While this one is having a population of 10,000. And again, when we create these buffers, all the metadata from the facilities were included. So we can also make look at the attribute table for this one. And we can decide to organize the columns and then deselect all and only see the name and the population sum. And then you will have a list of all the hospitals with the population here in this column. So we can see which one has most population in within five kilometers. And this one who only has 623 people within five kilometers. I think we I need to stop there. <laughs> I see that the time is going. I will just show you there is one more possibility. And there is a plugin for QGIS, which allows you not only to, to select the five kilometers buffers around, but you can actually check the travel distance. So how far can you travel within, for example, 30 minutes and 60 meters, either by walking or by car. And then you can get the polygons for these areas and then measure the population, which of course will be very different than just taking the, the, the radius. Okay, I'm running out of time. Uh, just to mention, we have a, had a GIS Academy, the first ever we had uh, last year in India. And this is a possibility, something we can organize for other his groups. This was together with Hispidia, where we can teach you more of these techniques. Uh, we really want more of you to use the, the mapping tools and the more advanced capabilities. Okay, I have maybe have a few minutes for question. Austin, do you know if anything has arrived? Uh, thanks for the great presentation, Bjorn. Um, there was one question that I kind of answered, but I'll, I'll bring it up to you as well in case you have any other insights. Uh, the question was about cases where staff ends up entering events with coordinate zero, zero. Uh, is there a way to edit this in bulk 
or the only way to fix this is to go in the capture or tracker app, find, the, find and edit each event individually. Uh, I, I think uh, I'm more, <laughs> um, I'm more, I'm less into the Odo's interface than the maps app, but I think you need to, to fix it individually. Yeah, uh, so my, my suggestion there, I'll just share it with the, with the group here, was that you can, uh, so the second half of that question was something that can help staff correct these errors faster if there are a lot is to get an export file from the Maps app containing only the outliers. It can be a new select feature option uh, where you select all the points and export all data associated with them in a spreadsheet or JSON. Uh, so I mentioned that there is the download data capabilities in the event layer for the Maps app. So you could download all of the files as a GeoJSON file and then edit them in QGIS, for instance, if you wanted to. Hmm. Um, obviously, you need to know where the points are actually supposed to be. So bulk editing is kind of difficult um, because they might not all be this, supposed to be in the same place, even though they all ended up at zero, zero. Um, hmm. I also mentioned that it should be possible to export the events directly from the uh, the import export app and then re-import them to the import export app. So you could edit them manually in QGIS or something um, when you do the, the export and then re-import them into the import export app. That's probably the best we have now. And I mentioned that it'd be, it'd be nice to have some sort of an invalid geometry search function and bulk edit capabilities. Um, but that's not currently in the core of DHS2. Hmm. Uh, yeah, any other thought, thoughts on that? I mean, it, it's, it's hard to, I think it's hard to <laughs> rectify those errors because you don't necessarily know where that coordinate is supposed to be hmm. when, it, when it's entered at zero, zero. Hmm. Now that's the challenge. You sort of need to, to take an individual account on each of them, view on them. So. Yeah. But I would say that like it also strong arguments for not allowing coordinates of zero zero since it's yeah. basically nothing, at least within our field of work, <laughs> it's nothing, it should never be, be located there. Yeah. So that's, that's a good feature request maybe for the capture app. Mm. Um, that was the only question. It looks like that same person is, is responding now. So they might have a follow up question, but there's no other questions on the community practice at the moment. There are a couple more in the zoom Q and A if you want to take a look at that. Um, I see two there. Um, sure, I'll, I'll just mention them and Bjorn, you can answer maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one is how are the colored squares calculated? Is it population density in a specific area? And what is the area measurement? So for the population data I showed now, they are with this 100 by 100 meter square there is the total population living within this. I don't have the details of how these maps are, are, uh, are created and how accurate they are. I think they are looking at building footprints and some advanced, advanced tools there to, to sort of uh, measure the data. So when we add our own polygons on top, these tools are basically just counting the, the squares, the 100 and 100 by 100 meter squares that fall within this polygon and then just sum up all the values for each square. Yeah, cool. Um, and then the second question, which I think you did, but it came in at the very end, so maybe they missed it, um, was kindly walk us through how to get the population density from Google Engine into DHIS2. Oh, so maybe that's getting the actual data into DHIS2. Maybe that's the question. So maybe I can, is that the last question? I can just do my summary and mention it. Yeah. Yeah. So just a quick summary that DHIS2 maps is mostly just to make maps. So to view your data, it has still quite limited uh, capabilities of analysis. And then you need to move out to other GIS program, which is not very easy with the download data functionality we have. Uh, we have also interoperability as the main focus for the next maps app. So we want to make it even easier to move data between DHS2 maps and other tools. And there are also some new, very recent initiatives to actually add these capabilities into the maps app itself. So we are looking both with in, to, into this with Google and Esri now, 
to see if you can just import uh, population data, add your boundaries or facilities, and then do this calculation directly within the maps app. So yeah, I think that is it. We have, we have been through the session. We have spent the time. Uh, thanks a lot for following. I will still look at um, the questions in this uh, community channel. So you can please continue to post them there and I will try to answer. Thank you.